Good morning to everyone. Friday morning. Welcome to History Matters and so does coffee. And I actually have coffee, which is very exciting. And I've even had some already. And what mug do you have there, Annie? Oh, I have uh it's your famous quote. Ah, thank you for engaging. And it's the hundredth uh episode bingo mug. Oh really made. I still can't quite believe where we are, but I say that every time and I, I don't I'm I covered up chat so I'm guessing 184 maybe our 184th Carly is that correct I'm uh, terrible numbers. I'm bad um 184 yep. I guess it right Woo okay um so the topic today the title I gave it was what the heck just happened uh history and uh the speaker ouster uh wow that was quite a thing, still is quite a thing. Um, and a lot of people are saying a lot of things. So uh, I wanted to offer a little bit of historical context um, and talk about a little bit of what I think it is uh, and to make some suggestions about where you can sort of plug it in to better understand it. But before I do that, I will turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans from New American History. And as always, I'm delighted to be with you today. Uh, this is a very interesting topic. I know everybody wants to get to it. Uh, so I'll just say the chat is lovely, but if you have questions about this topic, those go down below in the q and I'll be back in about 30 minutes and we'll take some of those great questions. Excellent. Um, and any of you who are here for the first time, uh, please say so in chat, because we have a wonderful community that has been here for, thus far, 183 straight episodes. They're a great community. They're actually a community, and you will get a robust welcome uh, if you let folks know that you're here for the first time. Okay, on with the show. Um, so it, it doesn't take, <laughs> I don't have to explain. Normally, I start by explaining, here's why I'm talking about this topic. No explanation is needed. It took me a little while to post this week because I was trying to figure out what angle I wanted to take. Uh, and not surprisingly, what you're going to hear and what makes perfect sense is um, an angle that focuses on the historical context and what that can and can't tell us about it. Now, it's tempting to see what happened and say, oh, it's the Republican Party. That's why that happened. Or to be a little more specific, it's the fractured Republican Party. That's why that happened. And there's truth in that, but that's it's too easy a solution. And I think a lot of people are pointing to aspects of what happened um, as though, as people tend to do, they're new or shocking. Oh my gosh. This hasn't happened before. And there are many aspects of it, actually, that have happened before. Some have not. Um, a speaker has never been ousted in that way, voted out before. Um, but there are other aspects of this that actually are very much in the American tradition. So that's what I wanted to talk about this morning was ways that um, in the past, kind of through process of elimination, to talk first about what isn't news. <laughs> here. Like, what should we not be shocked at? Um, and that's where I'm going to start. And then I'll sort of move my way into what I think this episode suggests. And I have to say, um, it was very funny because I was supposed to be at a meeting right around the time this was happening. I was, I was at Yale and I ended a class and I had like a 10 minute gap before a meeting. And I thought, oh, let's see what's going on in the house. And they were debating, but it was very clear there was about to be a vote. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm sort of, I got a meeting. Okay, I can be a little late. I got a meeting. I, I can be a little later. And then they're voting. And I'm like, okay, how can I not, given what I focus on, given the scholarship that I do, how can I be like, darn, I missed the vote to oust the speaker because I had to go to a meeting. So true confession to you, the History Matters community, I did not go to the meeting. I watched this happen. How could I not? Uh, and it was good that I watched what happened. It was good to see it. it. It registers in a different way when you see something like that. And I want this to be one of the things registered in my brain as I'm processing what's going on right now. But OK, so let's look at the process of elimination. What isn't news here? And let's start with uh, one big one. 
fractured political parties. Fractured political parties are not new. It is not a new thing that there is a party and in Congress or outside of Congress that has a dramatic fracture. And even though the fracture may cause drama, the idea of fractures goes all the way back. America has always been interesting in the realm of political parties. Um, initially, you know, in the sort of founding era, um, people didn't think political parties, national political parties were going to happen or were really necessary. They assumed lots of little factions bumping up against each other and they were kind of surprised when you got Federalists and Republicans. A another interesting question, and I'll talk about this in a moment. You know, generally speaking, we tend to have two major parties at a time, which is not the case in many other countries. That's interesting as well. And that partly has to do, it suggests some of what I'm gonna talk about here about fractured political parties. Because if you look back over the long haul of political history, wow, there's a lot of fractured political parties, right? I mean, like serious fractures. The first one, which is less over policy and just more over personality, goes back to the first pseudo parties and that's the Federalists. The Federalists split between John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, the Hamilton faction, although he, you know, he refused to call it a party or a faction, but the Hamilton section, whatever you want to call it, sometimes it's called the high Federalists because he was kind of extreme. Uh, and then there were the Adams Federalists, but they split, they split right before, well, a little bit before a presidential election of 1800. And then Hamilton attacks John Adams in a pamphlet, which might not have been the best move he ever, ever made. He had a strategy. I think he thought he would pull enough votes away from Adams to get a different Federalist, the vice presidential candidate in instead, and didn't work so well. Um, but at any rate, first, one of the first two parties or party-ish organizations, book it fractures. Okay, then move ahead a little bit in time, 1820s. The Jeffersonian Republicans in Congress, boop, fracture and split over issues having to do with the federal government. So now um, you have uh, some Republicans who actually favor a national bank. Uh, they like funding of internal improvements like bridges and canals. Um, and they become known as national Republicans. Then there are old Republicans, which are more traditional in the sense that they support states' rights, they want a smaller federal government. So again, um, you know, the Federalist Party ends early-ish in the 19th century by 1820, boom, you know, we now, once again, have fractured parties. Um, some, when you move ahead a little bit in time um, and you see the rise of um, Andrew Jackson and the Democratic Party, what ultimately becomes the Whig Party, which initially is the anti-Jackson party, is composed of lots of splinters from, <laughs> from other groups, right? It's not like a new party is born. It's like people come together and say, wow, we all hate Jackson. <laughs> and we agree on some basic things. So again, not solid, you know, wow, is it shocking for parties to be fractured. Um, and actually, one thing I'll suggest, if you're ever curious, it's a great way to do this. There is a website uh, which is maintained by Congress. Um, and it is, it's actually wonderful for any number of reasons, for teaching, I think, for use, research use. Um, I don't know the official URL. When I want to find it, the way I've been finding it for years is to type the word bioguide, B-I-O-G-U-I-D-E biographical guide. And what you get is a database of every single person who has ever been in Congress, um, a little biographical detail about them, uh, some lists of the major books and articles about them, a list of where you can find primary sources about them. And if I'm correct, because there's a new version of it, one of the things you can do is search and specify party. Nothing else but party, you're searching whatever. You can specify a search so that what you end up getting is like a list of a bazillion parties that have existed since the beginning of the United States. It's a dramatic way. You know, some of these parties you probably will never have heard of. They don't last very long, but it's a great way to demonstrate that politics has not always been this clean and perfect 
two-party system. Okay, so fractured party, uh, definitely not new. We've definitely also had contentious speakerships before, though, as I said at the beginning, a party ousting its own speaker and voting him out, that's something new and special. Um, there had before been motions to vacate the speakership. Um, it only was subject to a floor vote once in 1910. And in that case, uh, Joe Cannon, Uncle Joe, the speaker, um, he, he was not ousted. That's the only time there's been an attempt at this. Um, there were two other occasions when members of Congress were at least talking about a motion to boost, to boost, to oust um, a speaker. But in those two cases, it never even made it to any kind of a vote. And that's it. So first of all, a new thing is ousting him by this kind of vote, one party doing it against itself, but controversial speakerships, speakerships in which, you know, really controversy surrounds it and throughout their time, uh, it, they even attract nicknames because they're extreme in one way or another. It's not new, certainly, that a speaker of the house is probably almost the rule rather than the exception that a speaker of the house has been controversial. The question is, in what way are they controversial? Um, but that's again, also kind of a rule. Uh, and when I was working on my last book, there are all kinds of moments when um, members of the opposing party are trying to egg on the speaker to insult him so that he'll say something outrageous and they can make a fuss. Um, so it's an, it's an ongoing issue. Speakers, members of Congress of different parties trying to do something to the speaker for whatever reason they wanna do it. Okay, speakers. Next, extremism, okay? We've got not only a fractured Republican party, but we've got real extremists in it. Um, that's definitely not new in American history. I, mean, I, I don't even really need to say that. Um, it's again, uh, more the rule, rather the exception that there are extremists about with very extreme views. Uh, sometimes uh, racist, sometimes anti-Semitic, often both, uh, and a third number of ways in which you have extreme sects uh, or extreme ideas floating around that have a lot of support. Um, the one I'll mention here, only because there's amazing stuff online, is um, the Nazi party in the United States in the 1930s or the German American Bund party, um, but they supported Hitler and the new Germany. Um, and then they had a big showing. They had a huge rally in 1939 at Madison Square Garden that had thousands and thousands of people and other many thousands outside um, sort of, you know, making a display of what they believed and thought. It was a big deal. The Nazi, in essence, Nazis. Um, so, you know, if you want to say that it's unusual to have extreme extremists, not so much, and and not even can you say extreme extremists who have enough members that they might do damage. And what I would point you to, because it's kind of amazing to see, um, there is um, an NPR page uh, that's titled, I believe, When Nazis Took Manhattan, which is interesting to read and gives a great account of what happened. But towards the bottom, it includes a link to a video, actually a short documentary that has a video of the rally. So, which is shocking to see because there's Nazi activity going on on the stage and a big banner of George Washington behind what's going on. So I highly encourage you to take a look at that. It's, it's shocking. And if I remember correctly, the, the very brief documentary on the rally was at least nominated for an Academy Award. Okay. And I should say, you know, Obviously, this fracture, um, this this group uh, of the extremists, white supremacy, fascism, it was a, a really a real mix of a lot of ugly things. Okay. Next, the other thing I'm going to eliminate that isn't really new is election denial. Um, so, you know, in one way or another, pointing to what happened and saying, you know, 
a president presidential election being denied somehow or other fueling a faction and dividing a party and whatever you could put all these together in a blender and it, it sort of equals what the republican party is now but that's certainly not new either although on a presidential level that's something different if you want to look at the history of controversial elections that cause a fuss um, and divide people uh, look in Congress, particularly in the first half of the 19th century in Congress. Um, there were contested elections all the time. There were times when two different groups of supposedly elected members of Congress were both sent to Washington and then had to sit there while there was argument over who were the actual <laughs> representatives. So again, um, the idea that elections are clean and smooth and always decided wonderfully and that somehow we're in a moment where that's different. Again, not quite the case. But here's what is noteworthy, I think, about this particular moment. There's all kinds of ways in which American politics has been dysfunctional. I just talked about a lot of them. But right now, some Republicans are seemingly willing and even eager to abandon democratic standards and norms and practices. And when I say that, um, I'm not talking about some ethereal idea like, oh, you know, their ideals have changed. We need to shape ideals. I I'm not talking about a sort of cloudy, ethereal, hazy, like they need to think differently. I'm talking about what we've talked about here before and what you all watching this know about the sort of ground level brass tax um, policies and actions and bills and votes uh, that are happening all in Congress, but also throughout the states um, that are actually trying to, in one way or another, what do I want to say, chip away at, discourage, damage, and maybe even destroy the democratic process. And I'm talking about again, presidential election denial or election denial generally, not as um, something that happens once in a while and it's debated within Congress, but as you know, a banner that people fly even after they've lost the election. Think about contested voting rights and the ways in which just simple rights of, of voting are being contested everywhere. Think about the simple fact that on a structural level in some state legislatures, um, some Republicans are trying to literally change the rules of the game in a dramatic way, but like not just removing people from office, although they're doing that, people who were elected <laughs> to, to various office or people who are bipartisan, they're removing them to install someone of their own party. But bigger than that, changing basic rules so that, and I hate to use the word rigged because of all of the baggage that comes along with it, but what we're seeing on a large scale is one after another after another attempt to game the system, to restructure it, to reshape it, and to suggest, and this is part of what goes on among some Republicans, to suggest that any and all opposition is extreme and illicit and un-American, right? That they are right, again, long history in America of any party saying we are right and they are wrong. That's one thing to say we are right and they are un-American and don't have a right to have those views and must be destroyed. That's, that's a different matter entirely. So we have this sort of piece by piece, step by step, um, chipping away and stabbing at the structural democratic process, small d democratic process, and we have a good number of Republicans who are just allowing this to happen and not speaking up. That, when, when our whole mess began any number of years ago, I remember um, talking to some other uh, political historians actually of the 20th century. And one of the things that they said, which stayed with me, is um, I'm not surprised by what's going on as far as people being extreme and coming forward and trying to do all of these things. I am surprised that nothing, no one is opposing it. No Republican is opposing it. How can that be? And in a way, we've been 
surprised by that, we, the big we, um, have been surprised by that all along. We're no longer surprised because we expect it, but it is still surprising to think about some of the things that are happening that are really extreme. Like, oh, I don't know, attacking the Capitol to overturn an election. But still, there are some people who did not take part in it, who are not necessarily extremists, who will not come forward and say that was a bad thing. That's a shocking statement to make. So here's the thing, counter, a sort of counterintuitive thing. As I said at the beginning, you can point at the Republican Party and say the party is the problem or the fracture is the, par is the problem. I would argue it's the unity of the party that's the problem, because I think generally speaking, the Republican Party wants some form of uncontested rule. They don't like contests where anything can happen. Anyone can win. Their person may lose. They're temporarily or lose power in one way or another. Some members of the Republican Party really feel that they are entitled to power. They should always have power. And, it, and again, I, we've talked about this before too, demographics are not necessarily with them. And because of that, they're chipping away at the system, right? So some members of the Republican Party um, are basically, but how do I want to put this? Let's focus on rules, standards, and laws, and are really just working so that they can maintain power, period. And because other Republicans are just letting that happen, it's the unity of that. It's some people wanting it and others letting it happen. That's a problem. That's a big problem. And it's important for me to say, because I do think sometimes uh, for the reasons that I started out by talking about, it's tempting to look at things that happen and to say, oh, this is politics is normal, right? This always happens. One party wants an advantage. They do something about the other party. One party, I mean, you know, chipping away at voting rights, you know, that's happened forever. You can, you can point to things and say, well, that, you know, all of this um, is just how politics works. And in a certain way, you would be correct. However, putting all of those things together, looking at the desired outcome so that you're not saying, yeah, people have suppressed votes before, but you're putting this all together and you're looking at what's happening in Congress and you're looking at what's happening in state legislatures and even what some governors are doing, you're looking at a strategy, a, a broad strategy, a sweeping strategy, and it is not friendly to democracy. Um, at, when On uh, my podcast with Heather Cox Richardson, now and then, um, she would always make fun of me because I would find these diplomatic ways of saying things, you know, like what they're doing is not friendly to democracy. That's another one. I'm going to stick with it. But at any rate, striving for uncontested rule, supported by suppression, and in some cases, threats, that's not politics as normal. At its core, democracy is about contestation. It's about contests. That's what elections are. Um, you test policies, you test parties, you test leadership. That's how you make change, right? The elections, free and fair elections, where to some degree, people, public, the public interests are registered and change can be made. Negotiation, also at the heart of democracy. Democracy isn't about a clear, absolute ending to anything. It's about contests and debate and compromise and competition and elections and a winner emerges that represents in some way or another a majority or the spirit of the moment for the time and then another election comes along and you get to register that all again. It's striking that what happened to McCarthy, his seeming sin was negotiating with Democrats. You know, he, that, that's, in essence, and I haven't gone to look up the precise words, if anyone have used precise words, so you guys could inform me of that, but my impression is that he was punished for negotiating with the Democrats and that the extreme branch of the Republican Party wanted to punish him for that. Think about that for a moment. That's what you're supposed to do in Congress, right? You're supposed to debate and compromise, right? And you can be firm and you can say, I want what I want and I don't want what you want. But at some point you come together and argue and ideally 
figure out a solution, right? That's what's supposed to happen in Congress. So punishing someone for negotiating is an interestingly symbolic <laughs> and um, dangerous seeming act. Um, one other point I wanna make, I see I'm running out of time, um, but it, it has to do with how what happened to McCarthy is now being treated by some in the press. I, there's some people who are saying it, it's all the fault of the Democrats, right? The Democrats did this. There, there are lots of them and they all voted along with um, the people who wanted to, the, the handful of Republicans who wanted to oust McCarthy. So this is all, all on the Democrats. Okay, I, I have an issue with that. That does not make sense. And I don't think vote counting and saying, well, look at all the Democrats who did this, it's them, makes sense, right? There was a, a rule change to get McCarthy into office that Democrats opposed, Republicans supported it. There was a Republican who introduced the idea to remove McCarthy, again, it's Republican. Why would you expect Democrats to save the day? to come forward and say, no, we need McCarthy. Why does everyone blame this on the Democrats as though it was their job to step forward and fix things? And what interests me about that is when I was looking at Congress in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, there was an interesting phenomenon, which was, again, more in the 40s and early 1850s, Southerners would break all kinds of rules, do all kinds of extreme things would be outrageous. And it was assumed that Northerners would hold fast to the rules and keep order. So that you had one group that was, you know, banging on the walls and howling bloody mur murder and another group that somehow or other ended up being responsible, the grownups in the room. And they, it was assumed that they in one way or another would either compromise or make things okay. And you can see, you know, John Quincy Adams sometimes talked about lamentation speeches, which were the speeches that people would make after rules were crazily broken. Someone would stand up, again, not always, but some often a northerner. What's the rules? So what's interesting to me about people blaming the Democrats is it feels like the same dynamic, right? You have Republicans, ousting a Republican speaker, changing the rules so that they're able to oust a Republican speaker. And people are saying, it's the Democrats' fault. Why? Because they're supposed to sweep up the mess. It's their job. Because they're supposed to side with a speaker who has not been particularly friendly or trustworthy to them. Why are the Democrats the cleanup responsible party? Now, of course, we need people, some people to be responsible grownups in the room. But it's worth thinking how we tend to think about Republicans and Democrats, what that says about what we're willing to let Republicans do and what we assume Democrats will do on Republican and Democrat side. So in other words, if you're a Republican and you support some of the craziness and you think that the Democrats in one way or another should hold firm and follow rules, why? <laughs> That's the question I want to I want to put out there is that the idea that one group somehow are the grown-ups in the room that's a dangerous thing to think and it ends up leading to really bad dynamics in Congress and ultimately can create a dangerous mess. So um where does that leave us? Oh, I'm almost on time. So a couple things to take away from this. Number 1, although many aspects of what we're seeing now have a tradition in American politics taken as a whole, considered within the aim and framework in which they're happening, this is not just politics as normal. This is about restructuring voting and electoral systems. It's about suppressing information, reading books. It's an all or nothing approach. So that's one important thing. No, this is not politics as normal, although there are roots for much of what we're seeing now. Newbie is singing and bobbing his head and I have to mark that because he's been so sick and this makes me happy. Okay, number two, recognize what's happening. Recognize the pattern of what I've just said and think about it. Don't take the bait, meaning whose fault is it, right? It's the Democrats, no, it's the Republican. Look at the pattern, recognize it for what it is and then be loud about what you see in any way you possibly can. I'm seeing this week a lot of people saying, 
more stridently than before, we are in a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous moment. And it's hard that message by now is going to be drowned out because many people, including myself, have been saying that <laughs> for, for years. However, I do think in one way or another, the ousting of McCarthy has registered on some people that there's something going on here that you know, maybe in some ways is pushing in a, in a destroy all or nothing way that maybe they haven't recognized before. I think some people assume, and I've talked about this before too, that, you know, of course we're a democracy. Of course we will be, you know, uh, uh, have a democratic politics. We're a democratic republic. I don't want to say we're a democracy because someone will hit me over the head. Um, but of course we have a democratic politics. Of course, democracy reigns in the United States. Of course, we're different from other countries. Of course, we'll never be a nation led by extremists. No, of courses. Dump the of courses. We're way past that. So American exceptionalism, which is nifty and fun and comfortable, we have to not think that way anymore. And that's how we should be thinking about what happened in the House this past week. Okay. Okay. This, this is, this is, okay, wait, I gotta close my notes because there we go. Um, I didn't see the mug mug. Oh, uh, you're on mute, Joanne. <laughs> now I'm not. <laughs> I turned my camera on by accident. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I hit it by accident. I was trying to scroll down the Q and A to see what we had. Okay. But I was oh. like, I can't turn it off. It'll look even weirder. And then you hit mute. So it's like, it's fine. Yeah. Oops. Technical difficulties. Um, all I was saying um, was that I couldn't see mug, mug, mug on the bottom. Yeah. Because... Anyway, now I can. And so the, what the mug I'm using is in no way a surprise. There's no way I could not use it truly. Um, so I bring you the most appropriate mug for the occasion. Purchased, oh, yeah. purchased in the U.S. Capitol. <laughs> Oh really? Yeah. That's a nice heavy. I like a heavy mug. It's it's really it's like heavy. a flimsy handle. No, it's like stone. Mm -hmm. Um. At any rate, okay. And it is a manly, manly mug. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they have pink mugs now for the Barbie movie at the U.S. Capitol gift shop. I don't, you know what they had in the gift shop were um for a while at least some t-shirts and things with a Hamilton quote. No, this is, you know, some kind of Hamilton quote. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Ching, -ching. <laughs> this is a dumb question. I grew up in that zip code practically and I've been there a million times. I don't think I knew there was a gift shop. Where is the gift shop? I couldn't even tell you. It's in there. Um, I don't know how I got to it, but there is a gift shop. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you where it is, but it's there. So, um, all right. I see. I see all kinds of stuff going yeah. on in chat, man. Well, it was funny. Very early on, Clinton had made a bingo card this week. Thank you, Clinton. And Thank when you were talking about newbie getting sick, um, I think it was Tom said I didn't have vomit on my bingo card. <laughs> and then you said something, but you used it in a way that wasn't the way you normally do. But it's something that's typically on the bingo card. And I thought, oh, here we go. <laughs> All right, we have, as you can imagine, lots of questions. Um, okay, our good friend Cece, uh, who was watching a Bruce Springsteen video, she said last night, she says, um, who is Patrick McHenry and how did he end up as interim speaker? I don't think I've, she said, I don't think she knew anything about him and hadn't seen anything about those rules. So how did, what was the process? Do you know how that all works? I do not know who he is. It's not like he's been on my radar screen. Um, you know, my sense is, but this is not, it could easily be, you know, said, you're wrong, um, is that speakers generally have a person that's going to be there to take their place if they go. There you go. McCarthy designated McHenry as backup speaker. But I think the person who has been speaker has a backup in mind. There you go. Look at look at you guys. Look at the history. Of the we got we got bio. Yeah, we do. We have who he is. Um, anyway, this is great. You guys are filling it all in. But it's the speaker who designates who they want the backup to be. The the speaker pro tem. Uh, while it's figured out what's going to happen. Um, one thing that I read online and did not check, and I say that because maybe it's not true, but I kind of want it to be true. And I rewatched the video of the vote um, and what 
this person who was in the room said was that when it was clear that McCarthy had been ousted, there were gasps in the house and one voice from the Republican side said, now what? <laughs> That's a mug. Carolee, write that down. We need a now what mug. <laughs> I love that. I hope that it, that happened because, and if it did, it would be in a book I would be writing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Would it be on C-SPAN? Would they have picked it up? <laughs> well, you know, the, the footage is out there. I just, when I, when I listened, I couldn't hear it, but you can't really hear what people are saying other than, you know, the speaker's platform. Mm -hmm. So, oh, there you go, Politico reported that. Oh, and I will say, actually, um, I'm going to have, uh, Politico's putting out, uh, like, a feature. They asked, I don't know, eight people, like, uh, um, something is broken that the McCarthy ousting shows. If something's broken, what is it? And I'll be one of the people who's uh -huh. commenting. You will recognize some of what I say in my comments because I spent a lot of time yesterday thinking about this. But at any rate, um, not all historians, so it should be interesting to see. I don't know when it's coming out, but but it is political. But you'll let us know. I will. I will. All right. Our good buddy Gloria, hi Gloria, um, is asking, what does it indicate that McCarthy tried to be bipartisan and then the Democrats united with the right wing to, of the Republican Party to oust him? She's just wondering, like, what does that say in general? Well, I think it's a fine thing that there was a moment when McCarthy was, you know, bipartisan enough to negotiate with Democrats regarding whether the government shuts down or not. I think in the long haul, he was not Mr. Friendly Republican to the Democrats, right? He said he would do things and then didn't do them. So as far as that suggesting that somehow he was a good bipartisan guy, and that the Democrats should have stuck with him because he was a good bipartisan guy, that that argument doesn't work really well. Now, you know, given the now what comment, now what? Um, it'll be interesting to see who comes in next, and it could be really, 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 really ugly. I still don't think that's a reason for Democrats to be like, yeah, let's stick with this guy who's, you know, pandering to extremists and doesn't keep his word, you know? It's a, it's a moment when everyone had to think about what they were going to do and there weren't obvious answers. Um, but I think it was more that these the Democrats couldn't say, yeah, we support him. It, you know, it's not so much that Democrats were like, you know, yeah, let's join the extremists. It was like, wow, the Republicans just did that to themselves. We don't like the speaker. We're not gonna vote to keep him here. Okay, now let's see what happens. Yeah. So we have a, a new name in the q and A. I I don't think I've ever seen this person. So if you're new, um, I hope I'm not mispronouncing your name. I think it's Romy Fluke. Um, Romy asks, has there ever been a house with committees headed by both Democrats and Republicans as chaired? Okay, my, my uninformed answer <laughs> will be yes. Um, I can't pinpoint when, but I will also say, um, there have definitely been times where it's very much not bipartisan as to who's chairing committees. There's a um, there's a letter that I quote in my book on the 19th century Congress in which um, I can't even remember now the, the year or the speaker, but someone is given the speakership who is pro-South, pro-slavery. And this one guy writes to another and says, oh, now, anti-slavery members of Congress, we're going to be buried so deep, we're not going to be able to breathe. Like, we're not going to be put on committees. If we're put on committees, it'll be one of us and 18 of them, you know, and, and that's what, that's part of the power of the speakership. The speaker is a powerful position and does more than sort of conduct the orchestra of the House. Um, it, it, there's all kinds of things, um, like telling people to leave their, their, you know, their side offices, for example, although people are contesting whether that is allowable or not, um, you know, Nancy Pelosi being sort of pushed out of her office and um, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a powerful position and you're right. The question touching on the fact that um, speakers and committees, you know, those are those are things that are linked. So who is speaker can have a big, big impact on how committees work, who's on those committees and thus a big impact on a lot of other things. And, and yes, I see Linda says, doesn't Nancy have another office? Yes, she does. 
Um, apparently there are, you know, like, I don't remember the word I've seen, like side offices, you know, additional offices. And um, maybe that was the, well, I can't even go into detail there. I'm going to say something that's obviously wrong, but yes, she does have another office. So it's not as though they said, now you have no office. <laughs> now you must drift through the halls of the Capitol holding a, a bag. A closet you may use. <laughs> hideaway, hideaway office. Okay. Hideaway. That was, okay. All right, so uh, our friend Troy, uh, who you may recall played guitar with Bruce Springsteen once, Troy says of all the tests of the constitutions and norms posed by MAGA seem to be illustrating how much work remains to be done to fine tune our US experiment in self-governance. Gumming up the work seems to be sedition caucus's point is voting the only remedy provided under our current system to fix this all. So gumming up the works as an ongoing ploy and is the other half of the question is- Voting is gonna be the only remedy to, that we have right now under the current system to fix all this mess, basically. Well, so, so voting is part of it, but if, gumming up, if people gum up works in a problematic or illegal or unconstitutional way or against the actual rules that are put in place at the beginning of a Congress, then, then you're moving into territory that's not just voting, but then you have to have someone that says, you know, rules are broken and we're gonna enforce it. Then that brings you back to majorities and minorities and people enforcing things like that. So, you know, again, this, this gets to John Quincy Adams and the lamentation speeches. Something happens that's clearly wrong People stand up and say, that's wrong. That should never have happened. It's a clear violation of the rules of the house. And if no one does anything, there you are, right? So, so in, I, I talk a lot about um, accountability uh, in, as, in addition to contingency and someone just got bingo, I am sure. Um, but enforcement of rules, and I don't mean like fist and glove enforcement. I mean, just if people violate rules, actually holding them accountable, um, enforcing rules when rules are really obviously broken or, or you know, we talked a, a while back about hearings uh, and I talked about why um, congressional hearings are particularly important because they're line drawing exercises. Regardless of what happens in that kind of a hearing, a hearing very often is this thing happened and we think it's bad or problematic or it's controversial, and let's hear what happened. And by just having the hearing, that's a statement that says, this isn't normal. And so regardless of what happens in the hearing, sometimes calling a hearing is a really important point. So, okay, I'll stop there. Okay. Um, Dave, our good buddy Dave asks, what was the rationale constitutionally for the founders to have a Speaker of the House, not a similar position in the Senate, why put Speaker of the House third in line for the presidency? Um, well, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, I think, well, it, there were speakers generally in legislature, legislatures around the country. So having a speaker in the National Congress isn't necessarily new because there are speakers in state legislatures. So that idea is more like, well, here's what we've been doing and here's how a legislature should work. Um, the idea that there is someone who serves in that position, you know, again, it, England has a similar person in a similar kind of a role. Just from a purely organizational standpoint, that makes absolute sense. What was the second half of that question? Um, asking just, that was it. It was just, what, 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 what was the reason that they put that oh, yeah. position in third in line? It, oh, third in line was the other one. Yeah, and, and several of you are saying exactly what I could have said more concisely. English parliamentary tradition is a fine way of putting it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, so in a sense, that was not new and radical. As far as third in line, uh, you know, when you're just creating the government, I don't know who else they would have pointed to, right? I mean, you didn't have a formal cabinet at that point, really. Uh, the idea of a formal cabinet wasn't there when the constitution was being created. So it actually makes sense that if 
the president and the vice president that the speaker is someone, yeah, got to be someone, says Clinton. Yeah, um, it, it's someone who is in a position of power, um, who is put in that position of power. Um, it kind of makes sense that that person would be third in charge. You know, later in time, when you have a cabinet and secretaries of state, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that could be different. But at this point in time, when they're, you know, the, the, a cabinet, there should be a cabinet and here will be the people in it, does not exist in the constitution. I have to, I have to tell you, Joanne, Sean put this hilarious uh, comment in the chat. It says, we were talking about Troy playing with Springsteen in the chat, you know, and it says, when you crank the bass up too high, you blow out your speaker. <laughs> that is rock and roll right there, Sean. Man, that is, that is classic. That is really good. I, I <laughs> that, yeah, I don't even know what to say. That's so good. The, that's it, a mug. That's a mug right there. It's <laughs> true. It's better than an equivalent that I saw, maybe on Twitter. It's floating around. You know how when you are trying to prove that you're not a robot and you have to, you know, pick all images yeah. with stairs. And this yeah. was this <laughs> pick all images of a speaker and this actual speakers and then two pictures of McCarthy. <laughs> I haven't seen that, but Lois needs that for her government class. Yeah, it's. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. That is so funny. If you find <laughs> that, somebody put it in the chat because I want to see that. Oh, is, they said it's on Facebook. A, okay. Jen put it in a, a good way too. The head of the people's house is close to the will of the people. That makes sense in that way. True. Absolutely. All right. Um, let's see. This says anonymous attendee. John, I thought we didn't have anonymous attendees, so I am going to skip over that one because it's a paragraph. It's not a question. I just don't have time to read a long paragraph by someone who didn't identify themselves. So from now on, guys, make sure your name is on your question. Um, Lois had to leave, but she had a good question. So Carolee and I will make sure she gets the answer. Um, you mentioned trust when it came to McCarthy. Can you connect Hamilton's idea, trust and economics, his debt plan to the present mess? She said she's risking here her understanding of Hamilton's economic plan. You got to repeat that for me. That. You got to repeat that for me again. Yeah, she she's. I think this is something her students had asked her this week, and she didn't know the answer. Oh. Um, she said, "When it came to McCarthy, can you connect Hamilton's idea, trust and economics, his debt plan to the present mess?" Oh, okay. Well, um, you can certainly talk about what Hamilton thought about debt. I don't know if you can draw a straight line. Um, Hamilton um, didn't believe he believed <laughs> that there should be some debt. You know, he believed in, in part that's how you, um, that debt is a kind of currency. If you owe money, that money is essentially in circulation. So debt is good. Um, Republicans, Jeffersonian Republicans came down on Jefferson like he says debt is good. How can you say that? Hamilton said debt is good, properly managed. So he's not saying, yeah, just get the debt going. It's great. Spend, spend, spend. He said, well, properly managed, then it, it, it's a good thing. That was controversial as to whether there should be debt or not. Uh, you know, in the founding era, some people just wanted to pay off the debt. Um, and the question of the money that the government had and what it did with it was controversial in that period too, because the whole, there was a general idea and certainly people could see this uh, with monarchies in Europe, that um, you have a king, uh, the king, th there's some kind of war happening, and the king taxes the people to pay for the army, which then leads to a need for more taxes to pay for the army, and that there's a way in which there's a, you're creating a reason to tax people, and you're, you're creating kind of a structure in and of itself, which is why Americans were so unhappy with the idea of a standing army. Standing armies are tools of kings and they're all about, you know, having a way to shovel money and to pull money from the people and put it into the army and the army can hold the people down. So, um, wow, I just lost track of how I started there. Like where I, where I, <laughs> Hamilton's debt plan and Lois. Debt plan, thank you. Um, <laughs> all of these things are bound up in why Hamilton's plan was controversial. Um, obviously the most controversial thing about Hamilton's three-part plan is how focused it was on centralizing 
uh, the national government and empowering the national government over state governments. And also that in some ways he was appealing to wealthy people, businessmen, wanting them to invest in the government, even speculators, because he thought if they invest in the government, it might survive. That wasn't really popular either, you know? Yeah, I want people to, you know, rich people to invest, you know, if they want to invest in the bank, excellent. That wasn't necessarily a popular view either. So there are all kinds of ways in which Hamilton approved of debt, uh, properly managed. Maybe the part to think about now is how do we define properly managed? <laughs> Maybe that's the link. Maybe it's not being properly managed. I, I don't know. I can't, I can't at the moment off the top of my head make a more direct um, connection. So we have three pretty quick questions that are all more um, procedural, I guess. So I think we can knock these three out pretty quickly. Um, Dave asks if the new speaker will be allowed to reassign committee chairs and assignments. Like does I the new know. person get to come in and say, oh, you're out and you're in and you're out and you're in. Um, I, I don't know in part because it's never happened before. It, well, and right, it hasn't happened before. That's a big, good point. And also we're at a moment when rules and norms are bouncing all over the place. So I actually don't know. Okay. I think that's fair. Um, and then Francesca is asking, why can they not have any work happen in the house without a speaker? Well, actually, and I saw that being contested too. You know, you need a, a well, let me put it this way. Can you get any work done without a speaker? Well, clearly the speaker has to, the speaker pro tem has to help find another speaker. Um, you know, I saw some people saying, well, you can't pass legislation when there's a speaker pro tem and not a real speaker. But there are other moments when there's a speaker pro tem, but those might not be moments when there isn't a speaker at all, which is a long way of saying, I don't know in this particular situation what is or isn't allowable because it's a weird situation. You know, that's part of what's fascinating and alarming about living in the times that we live. Uh, is that so many things happen that, as I said during my comments today, have deep roots. We understand why they're happening. They've happened in some way before. But on the other hand, wow, they're happening in new, different, weird ways. And we just don't know what's going to come next, right? I mean, and we never, you know, contingency, you never know absolutely what's coming down the road. You can't understand history without looking forward in time with people as they were in the moment thinking about what comes next but not knowing about it but oh newbie agrees good people can hear him that makes me so happy um but we're in this moment where um you know I, I hesitate to predict sometimes because I I don't know I'm surprised again and again and again at oh they thought of this and the fact that there are people in congress debating what can happen next um it's fascinating as a historian you know historian brain is watching closely and American citizen brain um, is extremely alarmed. All right, uh, Dale asked, how could a speaker be removed or censured before the 1837 adoption of Jefferson's manual? Was there any kind of a procedure for that prior to that manual? Uh, that's a good question. Well, actually Jefferson wrote his rules when he, they're based on his vice presidency. So that's early, earlier than the 1830s. They got they get incorporated into the rules for the Senate down the road. Um, so that actually, you know, the a chunk of what consists of the later rules were very, very early, you know, again, um, the late 18th century, uh, Jefferson was watching what was going on and was compiling and looking at um, British tradition and British practices and putting together this manual of how things should work, which of course gets every Congress gets to create its own rules, particularly every new house, new session creates new rules, um, and they get to pick and choose how they want to put them in place, which is part of why, you know, who's the speaker and what, what rules have been selected and can you change the rules part way through? I would think the answer is no. Um, all of that matters. It's less of a matter in the Senate because it, it's not as though every two years, every Senator leaves. Okay. 
All right. Um, Richie, our buddy Richie asked, isn't chaos such as the speaker mover the goal of an authoritarian force? It disengages the electric and reinforces uh, the post-truth milieu. Yes. Well, when you look at what um, people who write about authoritarianism say, uh, or fascism, uniformly, they say that one surefire way of moving into that is people deliberately causing chaos. And uh, let's say in this case, Americans feeling the chaos want someone to fix it. And some dictator slash authoritarian, authoritarian figure steps forward and says, I alone can fix it. We've heard that before and takes control and the people opt for that because, oh no, it's chaos. And they walk right into a dictatorship and now you're in a different country. Um, so yeah, chaos, there you go. Ruth ben Gayat has talked about chaos as a strategy. I was just reading some of her this morning. She's particularly um, a person to look up and see. She, as a matter of fact, on Twitter this morning, I think she, she was talking about that. She's like, I, I've been talking about this for years. Um, yes, uh, chaos agents, making chaos uh, is a way to bring down democracy uh, and is a way to make people want a strong leader to fix things. Uh, and then you are, have you know one strong ruler, uh, a strong man, uh, and not a democratic government anymore. So yeah, um, that's, that's very true. And again, um, we need to watch what's happening and realize what's happening. All right. The, the person who typed a very long paragraph instead of a question, but it was in there anonymously, they did mention uh, Ruth in their, it wasn't really a question, it was just a paragraph they typed in there. So anyway, I was sort of trying to read it, but um, good thinking, please just put your name on, on the, <laughs> just because we have had a couple of, you know, Zoom bombers once or twice. So we're a little bit careful. Uh, okay. Debbie asked, we have time for one more. Why yes. is the media um, and, and serious people so invested in the whole, um, we expect Republicans to be obstinate and expect Democrats to clean up the mess kind of a narrative, she's asking. Um, offer that again. She's saying, um, why is the media and, and the very serious people, she has that in quotes, invested in the, the thought of expect Republicans to be obstinate, expect Democrats to clean up their mess? Because I think that's useful and comforting. Right. Someone has to like hang on to democracy, keep things going, follow the rules. And if you're going to accept a group of people not doing those things, it's natural that you're going to then expect other people to sort of fix them. You know, I mean, in a way, it's very natural and it's kind of comforting that we have a group of people that, that people want to put in that role. The Democrats right now, you know, Democrats are the grown ups. The Democrats will follow the rules. Um, it's, I don't think people explicitly say in the way that we're talking here, hey, let's let them be crazy because the Democrats can always clean up. But I think that's the underlying dynamic of what goes on. And as I said earlier, that's not new to now, um, but it's worth recognizing as something that has happened before uh, and that really can mess with the dynamics of Congress uh, and in some ways or another can sometimes be dangerous to the institution of Congress. All right. Okay. Um, the last one, if we have time for it, Gloria asked about um, Representative Jamal Bowman pulling the fire alarm, also abandoning norms. She cited that he's a Democrat. She said she finds it highly suspect that it was an accident, that she seems it was more to disrupt the proceedings and blame the Republicans for lack of a budget. So she wanted to know if you could comment on that. The only comment I can make on that is um, that there are claims that he did it on purpose to delay the voting. He says he went through a wrong door and it set off an alarm um, and supposedly proved that. I haven't investigated either, so I can't actually say, like, we know definitively that X happened. Um, so I, I can't go beyond that. You know, is there a logic that he did something to, to delay the vote? I suppose there's a logic in that, but did he do that? That I do not know. And, um, you know, I don't think he pulled a fire alarm. As I said, I think he went through a, a, diff, a wrong door that set off an alarm. And I think there's video footage of him doing that. 
but I haven't investigated. So I, I can't, I can't say that, that was a deliberate attempt to disrupt things. And I'm also not saying that people being disruptive in Congress has never happened before and will never happen again. It does. But it, it's one thing to, I don't know, make noise or not show up or, you know, hold your vote or all of the different ways in which people try to stop or delay, put it that way, delay voting. Um, that's not new either. It, it's what all this adds up to is what I, I suppose I'm urging you today to think about. What does it all add up to? Individual pieces, we can say there's a history. What happens when you put them all together and look at them in the frame of our current politics? And what does that tell you? What pattern do you see? And yes, um, the alarm went off in a different building, I believe. But again, I don't know the details there. I didn't look it up. So all I know is that there are two different claims. Okay. All Let's right. See. I think we I think we cleared the board for the most part. Um, and it's only three minutes after. We did pretty good on time this week. Yeah. People were also saying they could hear Newbie and it made them happy yeah. to know that he was feeling oh, better. So happy. At one point, you can always see me sort of looking up. At one point, he said, I love you, newbie doobie. And I just, my heart melted. It's like, oh, I didn't hear that. Oh, okay. Anyway, we can do that in the after party. Um, what's going to happen now uh, is that we are going to go to the after party. Um, what that means is that we are no longer going to record what's going on here so that we can be even freer and easier in what we say and how we say it. Talk about whatever we want. If you beamed in through the NCHE website, uh, then just stay right where you are and poof, you will be in the after party. Uh, if you are watching us on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to nche-teach.org slash conversations. nche-teach.org slash conversations. And then you too, poof, will be in the after party. Um, as ever, as your mug says, Annie, Thank you once again for engaging in the conversation of democracy on a Friday morning. We need to be able to ask these questions and debate them and disagree on them. And more important, think about what they might mean. That's what I've always hoped to do here on History Matters is to use historical insight to help us decode what the heck we're going through on like a daily basis. Um, and, you know, it's not surprising at all for me to say history has a lot to say, but not everyone is thinking about what history can offer. So anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for being this community and for engaging in these kinds of discussions. Thank you, Annie and John, for being Annie and John and for being here and, and making this possible. Um, I love you guys. You're like the best partners in the world, even though John goes away every time my face appears. <laughs> It's because we harass him for that 10 minutes before you log in. <laughs> Which I don't see. Um, at any rate. Uh, uh, we should videotape yeah. that as a pre-party. <laughs> um, good. Anyway, um, thanks to you guys both. Um, everyone uh, here, you know, if you're not going to continue the after party, um, have a wonderful week. Uh, who the heck knows what's going to happen next week? Uh, so we'll see. And whatever happens, uh, I will see you again next Friday with another episode of History Matters. That sounds just like the professional TV signing off, doesn't it? It does, it does. See you next week with a new episode of History Matters. Okay. Um, I, 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 yeah, I guess, oh, Facebook is gone.